Welcome to our topic, necropolitics, infrastructure and space, or why do so many of the things we make kill us? This is an unusual topic. It brings together a lot of material technology and social thinking. So we're going to do our best to kind of draw it all together. So part one is called the social relations of infrastructure. Infrastructure, like seriously, we're going to do infrastructure in a course on, 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 on sociology, on, on, on everyday life. Um, and technology, but yes, infrastructure is crucial, not only for enabling consumption by facilitating the movement of goods in both production and consumption and data, rearranging the world at the same time, which we'll, we looked at previously in the flip-flop trail when we talked about crap stuff, but infrastructure itself is a promise that we buy into socially, politically and economically. In fact, it's a really big social thing. Mm. It shapes our perceptions about where we live, where we want to live whether the politicians we elect are doing a good job, um, whether we're modern and sufficiently technologically advanced enough. Everything from the national broadband network to the condition of the highway to the apparent super train between Sydney and Newcastle or Sydney and Melbourne or whatever it's been that's been on the chopping board for so long. Um, these are all big infrastructure questions. And research on infrastructure in the social sciences has boomed in the 2000s. Like, I mean, really boomed. It's quite hard to escape. Um, in, in sociology, especially in human geography, anthropology, and even in literature, film, and cultural studies, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. So where previously, if you looked up articles on infrastructure, they'd all be in like engineering journals about how to make it, etc. It's increasingly in the social sciences. It's like a ubiquitous phenomenon in, in social life. Infrastructure is a constant in political rhetoric in Australia and globally. The promise to create, improve, extend infrastructure is at the heart of electoral politics and the business of government. So not just on getting elected, but once elected. The bidding, the contracting, the rewarding of infrastructure projects to different groups, to different cronies, to different interests, yeah. is a huge part of how government functions and society benefits and suffers from this. And the pork barrelling versus the not in my backyard kind of politics that goes around it. Yeah, I think infrastructure is a really important study. It's kind of like bureaucracy, right? Mm. Um, and classic sociology is interested in this stuff, you know. From the Durkheim point of view, about we need these things for societies to function mm. efficiently and kind of cohesive, have cohesive. You know, Weber talks about bureaucracy, but I think in a way, um, infrastructure is working the same as it's kind of a necessary evil in many respects. Mm. And we need it to have organisations, but it's often going to have these negative effects. And then from a more Marx point of view, you know, we need to kind of critically engage with this stuff because it's essentially the, you know, the cogs of capitalism, and that's what kind of is causing all these inequalities. And where is it, right? It's in its infrastructure is built up and technologically advanced in places where capital thrives and yep. has to go, and it's neglected and ruined in places that yep. capital bypasses. You know, Marx would sort of agree with that. Yep. If you've ever seen the ABC series Utopia, it brilliantly satirizes government obsession with infrastructure. I have watched it before. I, I can no longer watch it. It reminds me too much of a university. And yeah, working I, there, I, it's, I it's, too, it's too, close to, it's too yeah. close to the bone. Um, but yeah, I... I encourage you to watch it if you want to see how much a part of everyday kind of political and social life it is. Yeah, what is it? It's almost too, it's almost like satir satirization that's too real. That it's stuff. too real. It's like being in a meeting here yeah. at, at the uni. Yeah. Um, so what is it? Infrastructure are, are built networks that facilitate the flow of goods, people and ideas and allow for their exchange over space. Ideas so we still think about data connection, you know. Um, but, but they're things that allow the movement of things. So as physical forms, they shape the nature of a network, the speed and direction of its movement, its temporalities and its vulnerabilities to breakdown. It's no surprise that when there's armed conflict, the first thing that you want to knock out is the infrastructure, right? Because you stop things moving and flowing. Infrastructure comprise the architecture for circulations, literally providing the undergirding of modern societies, and they generate the ambient environment of everyday life. We're surrounded by it, we use it all the time. It actually is an important part of our ambient environment mm. infrastructure. Even if it's the pavement, for example, the street lights, that's all infrastructure. The and building of it's happening outside at that moment, <laughs> and you can probably hear it, right? The, the beep, truck's going in and out, yeah. In fact, that truck beeping, reverse beeping, is the ambience of being in this part of the university for the last three years, yeah. I think. Um, but infrastructure also exists. And I think here's the crucial departure where social scientists come in and humanities people come in that your engineering people don't, is that it exists in forms separate from its purely technical function. It's, it's, a, it's a semiotic and aesthetic vehicle. It's oriented towards an audience, towards particular addressees, even if you mm -hmm. never use it. Um, and 
they emerge out and, and store within them forms of desire and fantasy that can take on fetish-like aspects that sometimes can be wholly autonomous from their technical function. So yep. it can be a bigger thing than what it actually is. It's just a flyover. But it symbolizes corruption or it symbolizes mismanagement or it symbolizes you know, the coal industry over ordinary people. So it can have this really powerful social meaning. And why is this? Because in, as, as Brian Larkin says in The Politics and Poetics of Infrastructure, I'm just some of those quotes on the previous page are from that too. Infrastructure are matter that enable the movement of other matter. Their peculiar ontology lies in the fact they are things and also the relation between things. So uh, again, if you think about that, that picture there of that, what looks like a flyover being built, the flyover is a thing, but it also allows the goods to travel from port to mm. consumers, etc., etc., etc. The um, the grain to travel to the port to go out um, to market. So infrastructure go beyond their immediate functionality and as Larkin argues, needs to be analyzed as concrete, semiotic and aesthetic vehicles oriented to address ease. So in one of the early topics where we talked about technology and society, we talked about socio-technical systems. And infrastructure is a really good example of those socio-technical systems. So uh, Susan Starr challenged scholars back in 1999 to undertake the terrifying and delightful challenge of ethnographic approaches to infrastructure and the systems created by and reflective of human organisations. One of these things about making the familiar strange, you know, looking at these material objects that are all around us and what they mean and what they symbolise. A socio-technical system, thinking back to, to, to kind of our, our, our um, basics unit, um, is this idea that, that humans and technology are, are entangled in, 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 in system, systematic relationships so that you can't really pull one out of the other. Technology doesn't just exist for human use and humans are not just servants of technology. They're, they're, um, they're entwined. Ashamin says both the social and the technological are imagined as hybrids of human and non-human association with infrastructure conceptualized as a socio-technical assemblage, so something that's put together through socio-technical bits and urban social life as never reducible to the purely human alone. Humans are entangled in it, they demand it, they create it, they use it, they fix it. Authorities and unauthorized fixes, you'll see DIY fixing of infrastructure maybe around where you live, maybe other places. Where I live, I don't know who, but someone keeps filling in one of the potholes with just stones and rocks and stuff. It's not official, it rains, they all come out again, but there's kind of like this DIY fixing mm. of the infrastructure. Um, they lament it and they mourn it when it no longer works and no longer functions. The steelworks is a piece of infrastructure that you know is also a site of mourning. A lot of lives were lived through that place. A lot of the society, a lot of the city was lived through it. But it's still there, but doesn't function. So it's, it's symbolism, it's, it's semiotics, the meanings it generates. It haunts, live on. It haunts the city, yeah. It haunts the city, exactly. Yeah. And crucially, infrastructure thickens social relations. It brings people into social contact and connection. Think of a really basic way. The uh, crossing of a road, you stop at the lights, pedestrian infrastructure brings you into contact with other people. You may or may not talk to them, but it's what brings you into contact. It funnels you. Going down on the train station, you're funneled through certain walkways. So it actually brings people into social contact and connection in ways that don't otherwise happen um, without it. And I think really, crucially, is that infrastructure is also a promise. Um, there was a really great uh, edited book by um, Nicola Nand, Akil Gupta, and Hannah Appel, people who've looked at infrastructure in really different parts of the world, bring us together really quite nicely. And, and their idea is that, you know, infrastructure promises to make life better. In fact, it promises to sort of solve almost all our problems. Um, we just need better infrastructure for that. We need a um, stronger broadband network. We need a better road connection to here. We need to be able to pull things out of the <laughs> Pilbara and transport them elsewhere, and, and this community will thrive, you know. Um, and so this idea of everything getting faster, everything getting more efficient, everything being cleaner, data flows being faster, information, logistics, delivery, all speeding up, that promise of making our life mm. better is materialised in infrastructure. Yeah, the um, electric cars are a good example, I think. I mean, mm. and it's like, again, not being cynical here, it's something I'd actually like to own as well. Mm. But there's kind of this debate going on about, like, who should provide the mm. infrastructure for that? Like, mm. who, where should the charging, the charging be? Should they, yeah. you know, and, like... They take time, you know, it's not like getting petrol in 30 seconds. Mm. So, like, you know, it's conceivable, for instance, that you could build businesses around where that infrastructure is put. Mm. Like if, some, you know, you travel to get your car charged, there's a cafe there, right? And yeah. all this kind of stuff. But there's a, this kind of 
almost build it and they will come thing mm. going on here but the longer we leave the building thing yes. the more the problem that's trying to solve is inevitable and early adopters will lament oh you used to be able to just plop to the one charging station yeah. there's never anyone there now there's all these other cars here yeah, yeah. now I've got a circle and circle yeah. and circle yeah. Yeah. yeah and of course where will that power come from that yeah. fall on that it's not yeah. necessarily environmentally friendly and all these kind of things in fact it's probably rarely environmentally friendly but mm. it's really crucial I think that, that we give infrastructure its place and infrastructure is also analysed as a spectacle a reflection of power and the presence of government or corporate ingenuity and innovation. So building big things that look yeah. impressive, often phallic things, big towers, all this kind of stuff, to demonstrate not just a symbol of power but also a symbol of progress, technology, modernity. The and Twin Towers are a perfect example. Like yeah. The kind of symbolic, the symbols of like American capitalism and mm. that's also exactly why they were targeted. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and it's really important too for, for governments that are, that are trying to progress out of seeming like they're underdeveloped, etc., to build very technological urban landscapes, to demonstrate through this infrastructure that we're actually part of the, the contemporary world, connect big plazas, big things, big buildings. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah. um, Cyber Jaya in, um, in Malaysia is a really good example, built in the 1990s, to demonstrate that we're, we're a technology hub, we're part of this world, a very technological city that now almost stands sort of unused, and they tried to move the capital next door in Putrajaya. Yeah. Jaya. They inevitably date really quickly when people try and be kind of futuristic and yeah. those kind of things. Yeah. yeah. And then because to our next point, actually, because they can often be an enduring symbol of failed promises. So, you know, the, the, the empty infrastructure or the unused infrastructure mm. or, the, or the thing that time has passed by is also yeah. a really powerful symbol of So failure. what's interesting like that, too, it kind of it relates back to what we were talking about in terms of gentrification. So, um, you know, the post-industrial place where something moves out, often mm. kind of poor people move in and mm. start doing interesting stuff. Mm. But then, you know, people hear about it, want to be involved, and the inevitable gentrification mm. thing happens as well. And so, you know, that, that is profoundly related to infrastructure yes. and, 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 um, and production and, you know, where these things happen and where they go. Like, if you mapped the cause and effect that led to all of that, infrastructure yeah. would be a crucial part of it. Yeah. Um, the Sydney monorail is a pretty good example, right, of, you know, trying to impressively showcase for the bicentenary this mm. technological marvel that proved completely useless, expensive, um, stopped running. And yep. then the tracks and the station stayed even when it stopped running yeah. for a while. And now I think they're all completely gone. But for a while, yeah, you could still see these steel That's frames right, yeah. for it to run on. And, and I think yeah. they, the city of Sydney tried to sell it too. And I think for a while there, like maybe Hobart was thinking about buying oh, really? some of it or something. But they're like, I think they scrapped it all in the end, but like it didn't. Imagine happen. the infrastructure needed to send that infrastructure <laughs> yeah, to Hobart. Right. Yeah, yeah. Probably would have worked in Hobart. Actually. <laughs> I used to live near it, and you'd hear it whirring around, and then it suddenly just stop. Right? Yeah. Well, um, and all the stops were in kind of weird places in the city that didn't yeah. serve anyone. Yeah. yeah. Unless you were going to the entertainment centre yeah. and the court, yeah. like at the same day. <laughs> so. Or the Hilton. The Hilton estates. Um, but in most cases, infrastructure is not spectacular. It's mundane. It's barely noticed. And in fact, a lot of the literature on infrastructure says we notice it when it breaks down or disappears. Yeah. We notice the pipes when they burst. Yeah. Um, we notice when there used to be uh, a, a road here and it's gone, or there used mm. to be a bus service there and it's gone, or when it needs change. So part of the everyday experience of infrastructure is also improvising when it goes. Yeah, infrastructures yeah. like referees or umpires in sport, they're doing their best <laughs> when you don't notice them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Making do, <laughs> fixing, mending, repairing is also a really interesting part of how people engage with infrastructure, especially in, 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 in the developing world, but increasingly here. You'll see, I mean, keep your eyes open for bits where people have improvised around mm. infrastructure in, in your area or your neighbourhood, where they kind of like fix things up um, just to make it function a little better rather than wait for it to be fixed officially. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I think we mentioned before the Verge kind of gardens out in front of people's houses. Like, yeah. often the council put them in, they're kind of these weird empty square things of dirt and then people will kind of do something with them. Yeah. Well, you'll sometimes see people improvise street signs. So they'll be like, slow yeah, down yeah. in this area yeah. and they'll stick it on a telegraph pole or um, spray it on the road. No, in fact, in Layman like Street, which is where I live, there's yeah. 40, meant to be 40 k's, someone would, was putting their whiz bin out like every day with a slow down because there was cars I've, going I've up really that. fast yeah. and trying to stop it happening. Yeah. And so yeah. that's in a sense like an improvisation. Like yeah. the, the actual official infrastructure is not good at slowing this traffic down. So we've improvised and found mm. a way. Yep. All right, we will see you in part two.